the mistress of King Edward VII, Daisy Greville, the bold socialite. Daisy Greville was an active participant in the Marlborough House set of Prince Albert Edward, and despite its seemingly conservative facade, the club was anything but prim. It served as a notorious hub for extramarital affairs, with Daisy often at its epicentre. While cards were also part of the entertainment, the primary focus was on indulging in unrestrained adultery. Join us as we delve into the scandalous tale of Daisy Greville, one of history's most audacious socialites. Frances Evelyn Maynard, later known as Daisy Greville, was born on the 10th of December 1861 in London's Berkeley Square. Her father, Colonel Charles Maynard, and mother Blanche Fitzroy, who hailed from a royal lineage, marked an unconventional pair due to their significant age gap. At Daisy's birth, her father was 50 years old, while her mother was merely 18, setting the stage for a life coloured by intrigue and scandal. As the elder of two daughters, Daisy and her sibling, nicknamed Blanche after her mother, were fortunate in terms of their financial future. Their father stood as the heir apparent to Henry Maynard, third Viscount Maynard ensuring a substantial inheritance. However, fate took an unexpected turn with Daisy's father, failing to outlive the Viscount. Despite the tragedy, Daisy found herself the sole beneficiary, inheriting the prestigious Eton Lodge in Little Eton, Essex. With her father's passing at the tender age of four, Daisy's mother wasted no time in remarrying. Blanche Fitzroy's union with Lord Rosalyn, a prominent figure in royal circles, swiftly followed, resulting in five half-siblings for Daisy. Despite the loss of her father, Daisy's newfound wealth and familial ties eased her transition into a new chapter of life. With her mother's remarriage and her own maturation, Daisy soon found herself thrust into the world of courtship. Despite being considered a highly desirable match, Daisy encountered a setback when introduced to Queen Victoria's youngest son, Prince Leopold. His haemophilia posed a significant obstacle in their union, dampening the prospects of a future together. Daisy harboured reservations about marrying Prince Leopold, perhaps due to his delicate health. Fortunately, an ideal suitor was closer than she imagined. Francis Greville, Leopold's aide and son of an earl, stood readily available. Though it took some persuasion, Daisy eventually secured her parents' approval, and in 1881, she and Greville reunited in matrimony. On the 30th of April 1881, Daisy exchanged vows with Francis Greville in a grand ceremony held at Westminster Abbey. The event was attended by esteemed members of the royal family, including the Prince and Princess of Wales, who bestowed their blessing upon the newlyweds. Little did Daisy know then, the Prince's presence would soon exert a significant, albeit at times, tumultuous influence on her life. Following the extravagant wedding festivities, Daisy and Francis Greville plunged into high society, hosting lavish parties that garnered considerable attention. However, amidst the glamour, lurked a darker reality, as both spouses engaged in extramarital affairs, succumbing to the temptations of youth and recklessness, setting the stage for turmoil ahead. Amidst Daisy's whirlwind of social engagements, a cycling frenzy swept across Britain, known as cyclomania. Daisy, an early enthusiast, embraced the trend wholeheartedly, yet her passion for cycling would soon entangle her in controversy and scandal. As Daisy and Prince Albert Edward, also known as Edward VII, shared a mutual love for cycling and the fact that he had attended Daisy's wedding, rumours began to circulate, insinuating a more intimate relationship between them. Fueled by gossip, the press spun tales of romantic entanglements, prompting a musician to compose a suggestive song about Daisy, further solidifying her status as a topic of fervent discussion. Henry Dacre capitalised on the cycling craze with the song Daisy Bell, a playful take on Daisy Greville's exploits, though the identity of the song's narrator remains ambiguous. Speculation swelled, with many suggesting it alluded to Prince Albert Edward. Such conjecture, 
only served to amplify Daisy's prominence as one of England's most intriguing figures. In 1893, Daisy's father-in-law passed away, signalling a pivotal moment for her and her husband. With his demise came the inheritance of an earldom, propelling them to esteemed Warwick Castle. Here, amidst the opulent surroundings, Daisy found herself at the zenith of society, surrounded by a new circle of affluent revellers, yet little did she know, peril lurked beneath the surface. Recognising Daisy's prowess as a hostess, she was swiftly embraced by the creme de la creme of society, the marble house set, led by none other than Prince Albert Edward, the very figure implicated in the infamous bicycle scandal. This elite enclave bestowed upon Daisy a, a coverted position. However, with acceptance came unspoken expectations. As a prominent member of the Marlborough House set, Daisy and her female counterparts were subject to a startling decree. They were expected to entertain extramarital liaisons at the behest of the male members. This rule, coupled with a strict prohibition of divorce, ensured the preservation of the set's clandestine affairs. Under the watchful eye of Prince Albert Edward, divorce was viewed as a cardinal sin, capable of inciting scandal and tarnishing the royal family's image. Consequently, any member who dared to seek separation faced expulsion for eternity, a fate deemed far worse than marital discontent. Immersed in the intrigue of the Marlborough House set, Daisy herself succumbed to the allure of forbidden romance, engaging in an illicit affair with Lord Charles Beresford. Despite her mutual transgressions, Daisy's outrage reached fever pitch upon learning of Beresford's wife's pregnancy, a glaring hypocrisy that prompted her to pen a damning letter. Intended solely for Lord Beresford's eyes, Daisy's letter condemning his actions inadvertently fell into the hands of his unsuspecting wife. The revelation of her husband's infidelity plunged Lady Charles into turmoil, shattering her world and exposing Daisy's role in her anguish. Faced with the repercussions of her impulsive act, Daisy turned to Prince Albert Edward, beseeching his aid in retrieving the incriminating letter. Moved by her distress and mindful of her favour, the prince reluctantly agreed to intervene, setting in motion a desperate bid to salvage Daisy's reputation and quell the scandal. The Prince of Wales successfully negotiated the return of Daisy Greville's incriminating letter from Lady Charles, but with a significant condition attached. Daisy must abstain from London for the entire social season. However, the spirited Daisy adamantly refused this demand, unwilling to sacrifice her penchant for revelry for the sake of a letter. Recognising Daisy's determination, the prince, rather than insisting on compliance, redirected his displeasure towards Lady Charles. With Daisy steadfastly refusing to forego the social season, the Prince of Wales issued a warning to both Lord Beresford and Lady Charles. He cautioned that any scandal sparked by Daisy's letter would spell ruin for their social standing. Shocked by the prince's severity, Lord Beresford's emotions erupted, leading to a confrontation where he forcefully pushed the prince into a nearby sofa, revealing the depth of his frustration and anger. In the course of resolving Daisy's predicament, romantic feelings blossomed between her and the Prince of Wales. As their affair intensified, the prince's friendship with Lord Beresford disintegrated, clouded by a mutual desire for Daisy. Daisy revelled in her newfound connection with the prince, signalling her affection through a grand gesture. Desiring more frequent encounters with the Prince of Wales, without arousing suspicion, Daisy devised a clever solution, a private railway station constructed near her residence. This clandestine haven facilitated discreet rendezvous, shielding their affair from prying eyes. However, as their passion grew, Daisy's heedlessness invited looming consequences. As the affair between Daisy and the prince continued, secrecy became burdensome, prompting public appearances together. While Albert Edward's wife initially tolerated Daisy's discreet presence, 
Her tolerance waned as their liaison became increasingly conspicuous. The escalating gossip surrounding Daisy's romantic entanglements tarnished her once pristine reputation. Another scandal rocked the Marlborough House set, this time involving accusations of cheating, not in matters of infidelity, but at the card table. The Prince of Wales' penchant for barricat, an illicit gambling game, culminated in an infamous dispute where Sir William Gordon Cumming faced allegations of foul play. Unsurprisingly, Daisy found herself embroiled in the ensuing controversy, her presence adding fuel to the already raiding fire. Speculations ran rampant regarding the informant who exposed Sir Gordon Cummings' card cheating scandal, with Daisy Greville's penchant for gossip making her the prime suspect. As the scandal unfolded in court, the media bestowed upon Daisy a distinctive moniker, dubbing her the Babbling Brook, due to her marriage to Lord Brook. However, the depth of this scandal extended far beyond mere card games. Despite her ongoing liaison with the prince, Daisy's infidelity reached new heights when the prince unexpectedly discovered her in the arms of another man, none other than Sir Gordon Cumming. Daisy's betrayal extended not only to her husband, but also to her clandestine lover, revealing the complexities of her romantic entanglements and the consequences of her actions. The naming of Daisy's first child, Leopold, bore curious significance, given its shared name with her former suitor. Whether a deliberate affront or a peculiar coincidence, Daisy's unconventional tendencies reflected in her choice of names, adding another layer to her enigmatic persona. Following the birth of her daughter, Marjorie Blanche, Daisy disclosed a startling revelation. Francis Greville was not Marjorie's biological father. This revelation hinted at Daisy's clandestine affairs and the complexities of her romantic liaisons, shedding light on the true paternity of her children and unravelling long-held family secrets. In a 1923 confession, Daisy divulged that Lord Charles Beresford, a charismatic Navy man and politician, fathered her second child. Beresford's public persona and close association with Daisy underscored the intensity of their relationship, revealing yet another chapter in Daisy's complex romantic history. While entwined in a passionate affair with Prince Albert Edward, Daisy's romantic escapades took another turn with her involvement with the millionaire Joseph Laycock. Despite Laycock's casual approach to relationships, Daisy found herself drawn into a whirlwind romance, risking her heart in pursuit of fleeting excitement. As her entanglements multiplied, Daisy found herself navigating treacherous waters where love and desire collided with scandal and consequence. Amid Daisy's fervent affair with Laycock, he found himself entangled in a passionate liaison with Catherine Mary Hare, nicknamed Kitty. Kitty faced divorce proceedings initiated by her husband due to her involvement with Laycock, refusing to release him from the consequences of their affair. Ultimately, Laycock opted to marry Kitty, considering Daisy already had a husband. Despite this, Daisy's ardour for Laycock persisted, leaving the fate of their affair uncertain or so it seemed. Laycock's decision to wed Kitty didn't signal a sudden commitment to monogamy. Daisy and Laycock continued their passionate liaison, unabated by marriage. Moreover, Laycock's marital status didn't deter him either from fathering yet another child of Daisy, adding to her brood of four living children. For those keeping score, one offspring from her husband, one from Beresford and two from Laycock. With each new addition to her unconventional family, Daisy's reputation garnered increasing scrutiny from critics. Robert Blatchford, a journalist and author, criticised Daisy's extravagant lifestyle in scathing prose. His critique targeted her astacious consumption, contrasting it with the poverty and suffering prevalent in society. Incensed by his words, Daisy stormed into his office, demanding an immediate apology. 
Instead of receiving an apology, Daisy found herself engaged in an unexpected exchange of ideas with the journalist. Embracing his socialist ideologies, Daisy engaged in numerous discussions with him, absorbing his teachings with avid interest. Using the knowledge gained, she lined with another journalist, and she embarked on campaigns for education, poverty alleviation and women's rights. Her advocacy extended to promoting women's access to education and employment opportunities. Yet, despite her altruistic pursuits, Daisy's lavish lifestyle depleted her finances, teetering her on the brink of financial ruin. Despite these hardships, Daisy's love for spending persisted, starkly contrasting her dedication to social change. Daisy Gravel's extravagant expenditures extended to the transformation of her eastern estate into the botanical marvel. Employing a renowned landscape architect, she orchestrated the creation of over 10 acres of picturesque parkland, featuring a sunken garden and a lily-adorned canal. Unsatisfied with the mere flora, Daisy ventured into the realm of fauna, establishing a vibrant avian collection alongside her ponies on her estate. Yet the best pit was Easton's Menagerie, which was undoubtedly a majestic white peacock. However, such opulence came at a steep price, straining Daisy's already dwindling finances. Relying on her inheritance from her grandfather and her intimate ties to the now King Edward VII of England, Daisy had maintained her extravagant lifestyle. However, with the king's tragic demise looming, her financial security was imperiled. While the king had been generous, his reign was finite, leaving Daisy in a precarious position. Following King Edward VII's passing, Daisy wielded a potent asset, intimate knowledge of his numerous extramarital liaisons. Armed with details of his indiscretions, Daisy possessed a formidable tool for leverage. Despite her moniker as the babbling brook, she held concrete evidence to substantiate her claims. Determined to capitalise on her knowledge, Daisy retained a cache of letters penned by the late king, wherein he detailed his illicit affairs. While King Edward had been discreet during his lifetime, the revelation of his infidelities promised scandal of unprecedented proportions, threatening to tarnish his posthumous legacy. Undeterred by legal barriers to selling the incriminating letters, Daisy sought to monetize her explosive revelation. Approaching the new King Edward's son, she warned of the damning implications of the letters for the monarchy's reputation. Despite swift intervention from royal officials, Daisy remained undeterred, exploring alternative avenues to sell her scandalous trove. Though thwarted in her attempts to peddle the letters with legal confines, Daisy's determination remained unyielding. Turning to the American media, she sought a buyer, driven by desperation to alleviate her mounting debts. Yet, as she treaded this treacherous path, the question lingered. How far would Daisy go in pursuit of financial solvency? As the spectre of public scandal loomed over the monarchy, a solution emerged from an unexpected quarter. Arthur de Cross, a wealthy British politician and industrialist, recognised Daisy Greville's financial plight and her desire for recompense. Sensing an opportunity, he proffered a substantial sum, equivalent to £80,000, a princely sum back then, which translates to nearly £8 million today in exchange for her letters. With her financial woes pressing, Daisy readily accepted his offer, hoping it would suffice to alleviate her debts, but uncertainty lingered, would this windfall prove adequate? Despite the influx of funds from the sale of her letters, Daisy found herself mired in lingering debt. Seizing upon an unconventional solution, she entertained the notion of penning a memoir. Aware of the potential scandalous revelations such a memoir might entail, interested parties negotiated with Daisy to ensure the manuscript remained discreet. In exchange for absolving her financial burdens, Daisy agreed to submit her memoir for editing, permitting the exclusion of any objectionable content. Daisy's memoir, Life's Ebb and Flow, 
eventually emerged, Albert heavily sanitised to appease concerned parties. While some anticipated scandalous revelations, the memoir received scathing criticisms from an unexpected source, Daisy's own daughter, condemned it as vulgar muck. Despite familial reproach, the memoir continued, offering a poignant glimpse into Edwardian society. This newfound pursuit signalled a departure from Daisy's normal pursuit of romance and scandal. In her twilight years, Daisy found solace and purpose in writing, penning a diverse array of books, spanning from social issues, historical narratives and her passion for gardening. While she was often depicted as part of a royal duo, the truth revealed a solitary rider. Daisy never remarried after her husband's passing, although she did maintain her independence, it's conceivable that she still indulged in occasional companionship along life's journey. Daisy Gravel passed away from natural causes on the 26th of July 1938 at the age of 76, leaving behind a legacy that transcended scandal and romance and it was etched in the pages of literary endeavours. Daisy Greville, a woman whose relentless pursuit of beauty and financial solvency defied the norms of her time. From the lush landscapes of her eastern estate to the corridors of power where royal favour was both coveted and precarious, Daisy's story focuses on the tensions between the extravagance and constraint. Yet amidst scandals and financial turmoil, Daisy's legacy endures not only in the verdant gardens she cultivated, but also in the resilience that she displayed, ultimately finding solace and purpose in the written word. Through her life's twists and turns, Daisy Greville leaves behind a tale of tenacity, passion and the enduring quest for redemption. Lily Langtree, alluring insights into her life, the mistress extraordinaire. Unbelievably captivating and an absolute enchantress, Lily Langtree captivated the imagination of the 19th century London. As a romantic partner of no less than five high society figures, her numerous affairs resulted in substantial wealth and significant influence among the upper parts of London society. However, this lifestyle also earned her numerous adversaries. Embark on a journey through Lily Langtree's notorious pursuit of fame and fortune, witnessing her eventual and dramatic downfall. Langtree inherited distinctive traits from her parents that moulded her life. Her mother, Emily Davis, bestowed upon Langtree her stunning beauty, while her father, the very reverend William Corbet Le Breton, passed down his wandering ways and inclination for extramarital relationships. A perilous combination of beauty, wit and charm led to Langtree's involvement in a series of romances, leading a trail of admirers in heartbreak. The solitary girl among seven siblings, Langtree quickly adapted the need to emulate her brothers. She mastered concealing her emotions and thinking swiftly, adopting the behaviours expected of a young man in her era. Embracing a more masculine persona also meant engaging in mischievous exploits that no respectable girl would partake in, and Langtree was more than willing to participate. Langtree and her younger brother Reggie had a favourite prank that they enjoyed playing on nightly visitors to St Saviour's Churchyard. Balancing on stilts and draping themselves in a white sheet, the mischievous duo haunted the churchyard, providing unsuspected visitors with quite a fright. They might have continued undetected, if not for a stern warning from an enraged local threatening to use cold lead if the antics persisted. While the prank seized, Langtree's penchant for mischief was just beginning. Unlike her brothers who had a tutor covering languages, math, music and art, Langtree had a French governess focused on teaching needlework and household management, although Langtree resisted. Unhappy with her lessons and the governess, Langtree's father eventually conceded, allowing her to receive the same education as her brothers. Armed with beauty and intellect uncommon for women of her time, Langtree's ensuing journey was hardly surprising. 
At a mere 14 years old, Langtree captured the heart of 23-year-old Lieutenant Charles Spencer Longley, stationed on her home island of Jersey. Despite Longley's infatuation, Langtree herself remained largely indifferent to his advances. Despite her lack of interest, Longley proposed to the young girl, only to receive an answer far from what he hoped for. The proposal did not unfold as planned. Apart from Langtree's disinterest, her age made marriage inappropriate. Heartbroken, Longley took the logical step. He requested a transfer back to England, putting as much distance as possible between himself and Langtree. Despite continued proposals from other local men, Langtree's sights were set on the bustling metropolis, and she had no intention of remaining in Jersey. During that era, socially connected young women like Langtree concluded their education in London, immersing themselves in high society social gatherings and parties. At the age of 16, feeling prepared, Langtree departed Jersey for the dazzling lights of London. She accompanied by her mother and adorned in a splendid ball gown tailored exclusively for her, she anticipated making a significant impression. However, her initial encounter with high society turned into a complete fiasco. Langtree's introduction to London's social scene encountered unexpected hurdles. Her upbringing made her conspicuously stand out at the social events that she attended. Despite wearing her ball gown with pride, it seems woefully outdated compared to the fashionable styles of London. Feeling like a clumsy peasant, Langtree eagerly awaited the evening's dismal conclusion. Disappointed, she returned to Jersey, but her fortune was about to take a turn. Four years following her disastrous London debut, Lily encountered Edward Langtree, the owner of an opulent 80-foot yacht named the Red Gauntlet. Enchanted by the yacht, Edward's wealth and the influence it afforded him, Langtree swiftly attached herself to him, and the two embarked on frequent sailing excursions together. Although Langtree primarily admired him for his wealth, Edward's feelings were deeper. Edward's love knew no bounds. The couple enjoyed racing their yacht together, and once, during a race, Langtree fell asleep. Respecting her need for beauty sleep, Edward refrained from firing the victory cannon, a necessary step to formalise his win. Two slower boats passed him, resulting in a loss solely because his lady love needed some rest. Regrettably, the display of devotion failed to impress Langtree's parents. Described as a pudgy chap, his weak mouth overhung with a walrus moustache and his conversation powers limited. Edward Langtree did not meet Millie's family standards. However, the stronger their disapproval, the more determined Lily became to marry him. After only six weeks of acquaintance, the couple wed spending their honeymoon in style on the Channel Islands. Their bliss, however, was very short-lived. Upon relocating to Southampton to begin their new life together, Lily contracted typhoid fever, plunging her into a month-long perilous illness with only her husband for care. Although she eventually recovered, Langtree convinced her husband that moving to London would be beneficial for her health. In reality, she was eager to re-enter London high society. Did her second attempt fare any better? Not quite. The move to London proved ill-fated. Invitations to social events were scarce, leaving Langtree often confined to her bed with nothing but books for company. Meanwhile, Edward, a nature enthusiast, found himself trapped within the city's confines, resorting to heavy drinking as a coping mechanism. Bored and despondent, the couple languished in their rented London residence, and yet, somehow, their situation managed to worsen. In 1876, Lily Langtree received devastating news. Her younger brother Reggie, a once playful companion in childhood pranks, met with a fatal riding accident. Despite rushing back to Jersey as swiftly as possible, she couldn't arrive in time for the funeral. Ridden with guilt, Langtree spent the ensuring months mourning in her own manner, a process that caught the attention of influential individuals. Still in mourning, Langtree attended her subsequent high society gathering, adorned in a simple black dress 
an unassuming hairstyle. Amidst the room of women adorned in elaborate ball gowns, Langtree's understated elegance and sombre attire distinguished her, an observation not lost on the attending artists. Some covertly sketched the enigmatic young woman, propelling her into the limelight. During the event, George Francis Miles, another attendee, discreetly produced numerous sketches of Langtree. These sketches found their way into London shops. Her image graced postcards and storefronts were adorned with her likeness to attract attention. Artists vied for the privilege of using her as a model for their portraits. Langtree willingly posed for numerous artists as her fame soared, with a particular portrait causing a significant stir. Clad in her now iconic black dress, Langtree posed for painter Sir John Everett Millais, aiming to capture the hue of her pale complexion and towering stature on canvas. The resulting painting, a jersey lily, coupled with her distinctive skin tone, bestowed upon her a new moniker, the Jersey Lily. The Royal Academy showcased the artwork catapulting Langtree into the adoration of royalty. While attending another high society event with her husband, Langtree crossed paths with Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, Albert Edward, also known as the future King of England. Obsessed by the widely circulated images of her, the Prince orchestrated a seat next to her at dinner, leaving her unfortunate husband relegated to the opposite end of the table. Initially overwhelmed by the attention, Langtree soon succumbed to Bertie's charms, marking the commencement of the most renowned public affair of the era. The affair between Langtree and the prince became evident to all, including both Langtree's husband and the prince's wife, Princess Alexandra. Langtree's husband sought solace in drink, often disappearing for extended fishing trips. Meanwhile, Princess Alexandra chose to turn a blind eye to the affair, treating Langtree with kindness. The princess's apparent acceptance left Langtree with a sense of security, or did it? Langtree came to the realisation that emulating the social grace of high society ladies was an unattainable goal for her. However, with the prince's support, society opinions became inconsequential. Despite persisting in social faux pas, such as once asking a man who was the President of the United States who he was, Langtree ceased caring about public perceptions. There was, however, one individual that she aimed to impress. Langtree harboured a bold desire to meet Queen Victoria, a daring move given her ongoing affair with the prince. Nevertheless, the prince facilitated the meeting, though the queen's reception was less than warm. Despite the monarch's cold demeanour, the encounter catapulted Langtree into a social whirlwind, with invitations pouring in to meet some of London's most influential figures. However, her rapid ascent to fame foreshadowed an even swifter descent to rock bottom. Langtree's popularity began to wane with the arrival of Sarah, a French stage actress whose golden voice and stage prowess rivalled Langtree's beauty. Even the prince took notice. As Bertie's interest in their affair waned, Langtree's party invitations dwindled and the financial support from affluent friends and patrons vanished. In its wake, creditors began closing in. With finances depleted, Langtree faced the onslaught of creditors. Discovering her husband lacked the anticipated wealth, creditors declared them bankrupt. When they came knocking for repayment, Langtree's husband embarked on an extended fishing trip, leaving her to liquidate her possessions to settle the debts. Bereft of spousal support, Langtree sought solace in the arms of another man. Prince Louis of Battenberg succumbed to Langtree's allure, as her husband's abandonment and their bankruptcy unfolded. Hindered by the turmoil, Langtree couldn't invest the time or emotional energy in a lasting relationship with him. The affair proved short-lived, and the news of the events led to Prince Louis being sent away to serve in the Navy. The affair reached its conclusion when Langtree discovered her pregnancy. With uncertainty surrounding the baby's paternity, Langtree retreated to Jersey to conceal the pregnancy from the prying eyes of the gossiping society ladies in London. 
deciding to keep the birth a secret, she enlisted the help of an old friend. Though the Prince of Wales no longer sought Langtree as a mistress, their friendship endured, and he was not one to forsake his friends. Providing her with financial support, he persuaded her to spend the remaining months of her pregnancy in Paris, where her identity and story remained unknown. Grateful for the assistance, she accepted the funds and followed his suggestion. Yet a minor complication soon emerged in her plan. In her quest to conceal the true paternity of her child, Langtree devised a plan to present her husband as the father. To change the pregnancy timeline, she dispatched him to America under the guise of assessing and valuing some land. The suggestion wasn't entirely implausible, giving his ownership of land in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, he completed his assignment ahead of schedule, resisting Langtree's attempts to keep him away for an extended period. Langtree gave birth to a girl, Jean Marie, revealing through the timing that her husband was not the father. Their relationship began disintegrating further and her husband's escalating drinking habits and Langtree's waning interests led to their separation. Yet, this separation marked only the beginning of the saga, particularly for her husband. Despite numerous attempts to secure a divorce, Langtree's husband repeatedly rebuffed her petitions. Wild rumours about him circulated, and rather than disprove them, Langtree remained silent. One particularly outlandish rumour claimed he would covertly track her movements in various towns, seeking updates from those near her, but never approaching her directly. Under public and legal pressure to proceed with the divorce, her husband took to the papers to defend himself. He refuted the allegations, betraying them as attacks on his character, and vehemently declared, She shall never untie the altar knot as long as I live. Regardless of the truth, Langtree had to forge ahead. Her narrative was just commencing. Leaving Jean Marie in the care of her mother, Langtree returned to London in financial straits. Oscar Wilde, her eccentric poet friend, suggested she venture into acting, recognising her beauty and wit. However, societal norms frowned upon ladies of high society engaging in acting, necessitating Langtree to appear respectable. She achieved this by aligning herself with the Prime Minister of the time, William Gladstone, whose moral reputation legitimised her newfound occupation. In an era when acting carried a less than honourable reputation, high society women avoided becoming actresses. Langtree sought to establish respectability and found an ally in Prime Minister William Gladstone. Her association with him provided the social legitimacy that her new occupation required, yet her real challenge lay in the realm of theatre criticism. Langtree embarked on her acting career under the guidance of seasoned actress Henrietta Labouchere. While her debut performance in She Stoops to Conquer resonated with the audience, critical reviews were less than favourable. Many did not take her seriously, a setback that could have prematurely ended her acting career if not for significant assistance from the royal circle. Despite the fading of their romantic connection, Langtry left an undeniable mark on the Prince of Wales. When he discovered her new venture, he supported her by attending her performances. Wherever the prince went, crowds followed. With Langtry's acting skills improving under her mentor's wing, she garnered a significant following that propelled her career to new heights. In 1882, Langtree embarked on a theatre tour of America with her recently established theatre company. Initially apprehensive about going international, her concerns proved unfounded. Langtree captivated American audiences, breaking box office records with each show. America embraced her and in return, Langtree would find love on American soil. For the first 18 years of her life, Jean Marie, the daughter Langtree left behind in Jersey, remained unaware of her true parentage. She believed Langtree to be her aunt and Langtree's ex-husband was assumed to be her father. The revelation came when on the verge of engagement, someone inadvertently disclosed the truth. Shocked, Jean Marie learned the reality of her parentage. Jean Marie's fiancé revealed the truth 
Her mother was her grandmother, her aunt was her real mother, and her father was likely Prince Louis of Battenberg. This revelation, based on Langtree's numerous affairs, left Jean Marie angry and humiliated. She severed ties with her aunt, declaring they were no longer family, further diminishing Langtree's already dwindling circle of friends and family. Historically drawn to wealth, Langtree commenced another affair with the immensely wealthy Frederick in America. The affair made headlines, ensuring sold-out shows as audiences clamoured to witness the captivating woman causing men to lose their composure. Despite her husband's refusal to grant a divorce, Langtry revelled in her newfound wealth. Lily's life with Frederick unfolded in luxury. He whisked her away to an extensive European trip, purchased a townhouse in pricey New York City, and in a grand gesture acquired a private railway carriage designed by Langtry herself for a hefty $1 million. Langtry had hit the jackpot. With her newfound affluence, Langtree invested in American industries and real estate, allowing her to become a US citizen and legally dissolve her marriage. The divorce concluded, Edward Langtree faded into obscurity. Lily embraced her new life with Frederick, determined to leave her past with her ex-husband behind. Soon after, news of Edward's passing reached her and her response was unsparing. In 1897, Langtree's ex-husband found himself on a passenger ship in the Irish Sea, where an unfortunate fall led to a fatal head injury. Despite being sent to a doctor upon docking, Edward did not survive. When Lily received the news, it elicited little emotional response. Later, she sent a letter of condolence to another widow, stating, I too have lost a husband, but alas, it was no great loss. A cutting remark indeed. Langtree continued to augment her wealth by delving into thoroughbred horse racing, quickly assembling a stable of horses. She participated in races and accumulated prize money. During this period, Langtree crossed paths with George Alexandra Baird, a wealthy Scotsman prominent in the horse racing scene. Predictably, the two embarked on an affair. However, this liaison proved perilous for Langtree. Baird's reputation was less than stellar, characterised by aggressive behaviour, frequent clashes with authorities and a hot temper, association with questionable individuals and jealousy, a toxic combination. Baird's violent outbursts towards Langtry, including an incident that left her with two black eyes, resulted in a 10-day hospital stay. Furious, Langtry swore off Baird, temporarily at least. After the violent episode, Langtry remained secluded at home as her injuries healed. Baird, seeking forgiveness, resorted to sending her jewels and money, a strategy that typically worked with Langtry. This time, however, she remained unmoved and planned to press charges against him. Baird, desperate to win back the Jersey Lily, struggled for ideas until he remembered the one irresistible thing for Langtry. Baird devised a foolproof plan to regain her favour. He bought her a yacht named the White Lady. Delighted by the gesture, Langtree's friend disapproved, both of the yacht and her swift forgiveness of Baird. Langtree candidly told a friend, I detest him, but every time he harms me, he gives me a cheque for £5,000. Consequently, several friends distanced themselves, and the American gossip columns humorously dubbed the yacht the Black Eye, a cringe-worthy turn of events. Over time, Langtree's romantic entanglements came to an end. Frederick married someone else, and Baird succumbed to pneumonia. At 45, Langtree bid farewell to her acting career and settled down with Sir Hugo de Bath, a man who was 19 years her junior. True to her pattern, he was affluent, aligning with Langtree's motives. However, once she secured de Bath's wealth, the romance quickly dwindled. With financial security, Langtree frequented the gambling tables in Monte Carlo during her leisure time. Beyond her striking beauty, she displayed a penchant for luck, often winning substantial bets. Remarkably, in 1907, Langtree achieved the distinction of being the first woman to break the bank at Monte Carlo, surpassing the casino's ability to compensate her. As Langtree entered her 50s, she and DeBath 
essentially led separate lives. While Langtree resided in a villa in Monaco, her partner lived half an hour away near Nice, France. Occasional encounters occurred at social gatherings and he occasionally sought her company for various events. Langtree, not one to overlook neglect, ensured that he faced consequences in her final years. A 75 Langtree grappling with bronchitis approached the end of her life. Three months prior to her passing, driven by vengeance, she altered her will. Bequests were directed to a local museum. Her estranged daughter and grandchildren and Matilda, a local companion. Notably, de Bathe received not a single penny and in the end Langtree had the last laugh. Langtree, with her captivating beauty and ambitious pursuits, served as an inspiration for several modern-day characters. Notably, she was believed to be the muse for Irene Adler and Sherlock Holmes, the woman who famously outwitted the renowned detective. Her intriguing life and array of relationships have been featured in numerous television productions. Given the dramatic nature of her life, it's foreseeable that she will continue to captivate imaginations for years to come. Lily's life unfolds as a captivating tale of passion, scandal and resilience. From the heights of high society to the tumultuous world of acting, Langtree navigated a maze of relationships and challenges with unwavering determination. Her legacy as a woman who defied social norms and inspired characters in literature stand as a testament to the enduring allure of her remarkable journey. People perceive Victorian era as one of the public acting prim, proper and buttoned up. But Alice Keppel proves that what went on behind closed doors was very different. Keppel was one of the most scandalous women of her day, with scandal and antics taking place behind tightly closed bedroom doors. I will be taking a closer look at the life of Alice Keppel. On April 29, 1868, Alice Keppel was born into privilege with a silver spoon pretty much in her mouth from birth. She was born to parents Sir William Edmundstone and his wife Mary Elizabeth Parsons. The couple were renowned members of the English nobility and direct descendants of the royal house of Stuart. Alice's full birth name was Alice Frederica Edmundstone but her parents gave her the boy nickname of Freddie, due to being more like her brother than her seven older sisters. Not only did she act like a tomboy, but she also showed a great interest in them too. It was when she became a woman in her own right that she shredded the tomboy identity she had grown accustomed to during childhood. She was the epitome of beauty in the eyes of the Victorians, she had wide blue eyes, a tiny waist, and most infamously, a plump chest. Keppel gave up the nickname Freddy for flirtatious Freddy when she began to show off the assets she was born with. But she started to get a reputation for being a bit of a hussy. Although she was the epitome of pretty, her secret advantage was her amazing intellect too. She was highly communicative with people and she could get them chatting for hours. She could be eminently discreet and that skill set was about to serve her very well. Alice did what was expected of her as a young blossoming woman and in the summer of 1891, the 23-year-old Alice got married. Her choice of groom was the well-respected and handsome Lieutenant Colonel George Keppel. He was a soldier whose family had a deep history of serving the royal family. But despite being handsome and well respected, he couldn't fulfil all of her needs. She had very expensive taste and the income from the military just did not cover it. In order to bring in some extra cash into the household, she could have gotten a job, but instead she took a controversial approach to her financial worries. She began to attract wealthy men and started extramarital affairs, essentially using her renowned beauty and discretion to become a Victorian mistress 
and she was extremely good at it. Her first lover was Ernest Beckett, the second Baron of Grimthorpe, and he was much older than Keppel. He was known around the town as a philanderer, and with more money than he knew what to do with. It wasn't long after she started up this affair that she found out that she was pregnant. This put her in a difficult position in 1894. There were no DNA tests available back in the day, so she had absolutely no idea who the father of her child was. When Alice gave birth to a little girl named Violet that summer, and even her own family members were concerned that Grimthorpe was the dad. You would expect this would cause outrage for her husband, but surprisingly, they had an open marriage. This was not unusual for the times. Despite the people being publicly prudish, behind closed doors, many of the high-class families had mistresses and affairs. Her and her husband struggled financially, but after she started serving wealthy men, the financial burden was lessened, and so he was 100% supportive of her. He even engaged in some of his own affairs and once noted, I do not mind what she does as long as she comes back to me in the end. Although he was okay with her affairs, some things even made him question things when a prince fell in love with her. Four years later, the now 29-year-old socialite was living in the wealthy area of Mayfair in London when she was working as a hostess. This was where she would meet her prince, the future King Edward VII, the eldest son of Queen Victoria and the heir to the British throne. I'd say it was the start of a beautiful friendship, but it was more like an outrageous romance. Her new lover was controversial. The public and his family had a love-hate relationship with the man due to his womanising ways and endless scandals. He was married to Alexandra of Denmark, but there had not been one time throughout the couple's history that he had stuck to his matrimonial vows. He was always frequented with women of the night in Paris, as well as up to 55 mistresses throughout their marriage. He had a particular thing for other married women in the form of beautiful actresses and noble women throughout England. Not only did Edward have a thing for married women, She also had a thing for controversial bad men. The man lived a life of overindulgence in all parts of his life. He put on the pounds with all the food he ate. He gambled excessively, as well as womanised an unruly number of women. When the royal was 56, he met Alice and he was old enough to be her father. Edward even famously commissioned a love chair that would let him romance a woman without crushing her with his considerable girth. Yep, this is what Alice was getting herself into, although maybe it was Edward who should have watched out. Soon after her first meetings with Prince Edward, Alice Keppel discovered that she was pregnant again, and she went on to have a little girl called Sonia in 1900. A lot of people rumoured that Sonia was Edward's illegitimate daughter, But despite these rumours, Sonia was actually her husband, George Keppel's child. Prince Edward enjoyed a rendezvous with married women, perhaps for the secret sneakiness of it. He was probably surprised by the tolerance of Keppel's husband, who even accommodated his affair. The Prince of Wales was a frequent visitor to the Keppel home in Mayfair, and each time he appeared, George made sure to be on his way out. Although this was convenient for the romancing couple, it was also somewhat awkward. The Prince of Wales was used to getting his own way in all aspects of his life, and he would throw tantrums if he did not get what he wanted in the first instance. However, Keppel was able to calm down the King's mood swings with her communicative gift. She was one of the very few people in Edward's life who could reliably talk him down. As one witness commented, Edward was a much pleasanter child since he changed mistresses. The relationship was not one way. She gave a lot to Edward, 
but she also got a lot back in the form of financial security for her and her family. Maybe this was why her husband was so understanding of her arrangement with Edward. Keppel was working overtime as a royal mistress to keep Edward sweet, and he repaid her with the royal endowments. She was even able to secure her husband and her brother great jobs for royal connections. Keppel was popular with more than just Edward. Even his wife was keener on him than his previous mistresses. Alexandra of Denmark was used to dealing with his previous side piece, Daisy Greville, who was brash and loud about her bedroom association with royalty. Keppel, by contrast, knew just what to do to get Alexandra on her side by staying inconspicuous and not flaunting her affair in front of everybody. This showed great respect for Edward and his wife and she kept their royal relationship on the down low as much as possible. Alexandra couldn't help but like her and the Princess of Wales became, at the very least, an uneasy ally to Keppel. Alice had a way with men, but her ability to butter up women was understated too. She was liked by Alexandra, and even helped Edward choose gifts for his wife. And she was dang good at it too, once helping create a set of Fabergé animals, since Alexandra collected them. In 1901, Alice's life was upgraded to the next stage again when her man became the King of England after the death of his mother, Queen Victoria. The new Edwardian era had begun and Keppel was right in the middle of the period alongside Edward, the new monarch. She was able to gain great power as an advisor for Edward and she would often be the go-between for her lover and his ministers. Many of the king's deals were done in Alice's own drawing room and she hosted a number of dinners to tactfully get an arguable topic dropped into conversation to gauge effect, which was reported back to the king. She was able to do this inconspicuously as she avoided the topic of her political influence. Instead, she would rather it stayed quiet between those concerned. When the Prime Minister's wife, Margot Asquith, once talked about Keppel as the king's advisor, the royal mistress was furious. Before long, however, she had bigger things to worry about. Keppel was one of the most persuasive women in all of England, and she could persuade the king to do many things. But despite her attempts, she was never able to rid the king of his addictions, such as eating and smoking, and his appetite only grew bigger as he grew older and towards the end of his life he was enjoying 12 meals a day, alongside 20 cigarettes. Edward believed that he was immortal, but of course he was very wrong. Keppel was quite gifted in foreseeing future events, and she tried to stop the fatal events from unfolding when the king fell ill. She even reached out to a renowned minister and requested that he help her lover. She wrote to him, I want you to try and get the king to see a proper doctor about his knee. Do what you can with your famous tact, and of course, don't tell anyone I wrote to you. But tragically, this never happened. It wasn't long until the king started to deteriorate further. He was suffering from bronchitis, perhaps due to his cigar habit but he was also unfortunate enough to suffer from a rodent ulcer on his nose, which is a type of skin cancer. He was given radium to cure the cancer away, which was the treatment back then, but he still wasn't exactly in the best shape, and then disaster struck. Edward was not faring too well, and by 1909 his ailments were taking their toll on him. In February of that year, he lost consciousness during a state visit, and then in March 1910, during another diplomatic trip to France, the king completely collapsed, requiring a prolonged stay in the foreign country to recuperate before returning home to Keppel. 
Keppel was well respected by the firm and she had a great influence over the king too. This is why many historians consider her one of the last true royal mistresses, if not the last due to her ability to influence the official politics at the time. Not only was she intelligent, but during her youthful years, she was also an English rose, the epitome of the ideal woman of the times. One writer said of the famed mistress and society hostess, she could have impersonated Britannia in a tableau vivant and done that lady credit. She was a very busy lady. She had many roles as a wife to her husband, a mother to her children, and now the mistress of the king. She managed to keep them all happy, as her daughter expressed, because it was just in her nature. Violet noted that her mother not only had a gift of happiness, but she excelled in making others happy. She resembled a Christmas tree laden with presents for everybody. When her king returned to her in the spring of 1910, her life was about to change forever. They were never able to properly reunite ever again, as the king suffered a number of consecutive heart attacks in a row on the 6th of May 1910. The king did not give up. He refused to admit his frail state, instead adamant that he would continue and refusing to lie down. He is quoted as saying, No, I shall not give in. I shall go on. I shall work to the end. Alice got a whiff of the king's imminent death. She was beside herself. She put her composed state aside, instead breaking down in tears, busting through the palace and impolitely running to be at his bedside. Although Alice had gained a friend in Queen Alexandra, who graciously allowed her in, the situation was awkward and understandably the consort was not thrilled by the public display of affection from the king's mistress, while he lay on his deathbed. Edward was surrounded by the women he loved, Alice and Alexandra, and in an attempt to reduce the tension between the women, he ordered Alex to kiss Alice. This commandment did not smooth the situation and instead made it much worse. At this point, even the polite and patient Queen Alexandra couldn't take it any longer. She instead turned to Alice and demanded that she leave the room. Keppel's response has gone down in history. She had been given a direct order by the Queen, who was of a higher ranking than her. The realisation that she would never see the King again dawned on her and she became hysterical in her response. She broke down into rage sobs, screaming, I never did any harm. There was nothing wrong between us. What is to become of me? Sadly, it didn't end there. Keppel was so beside herself and out of her mind with grief that she couldn't even leave the king's bedside of her own free will. Instead, she had to be dragged out of the room by members of the royal household while she was still sobbing and screaming, and they pretty much threw her out onto the street. It wasn't Keppel's most dignified moment, and she knew it. She took some time after this fiasco to reflect on the events, but she just tried to pretend it had never happened in a bid to remove all embarrassment. It took a long time for her to openly admit the truth of that day, and perhaps even longer to come to terms with what happened next. Just after half eleven in the evening on the 6th of May 1910, King Edward VII brewed his last passing at the age of 68. The King's death wasn't just the end of the Edwardian era, it was also the end of Alice Keppel's influence in the royal court. So while the world prepared to give the monarch a state funeral, Keppel planned her final goodbye. Now the Dowager Queen Alexandra kindly allowed the King's mistress to be part of the funeral on the 17th of May. However, she made sure that the couple's relationship was kept from the public eye as she was to enter and leave through a side door. Keppel had completely fallen out of favour with the court after the death of the king, though she no longer had any standing or influence in the court. Her scandalous position made her enormous enemies. 
and among them was Edward's son and heir, the new King George V, and his wife, Mary of Teck. They wished for a more traditional court and wanted to rid it of his father's debauched ways. The first step to this was to ban Keppel from it altogether. With the king's cold body lying in the ground, Alice Keppel was forced to make a heartbreaking decision. She was no longer welcome in the many drawing rooms that she used to light up. Her family made the decision to leave England for a better life. And in November 1910, just a few months after Edward's passing, she still had all of the same skills that she had before and her ability to woo people did not stop in the royal court. She went on to make famous friends while in Italy in exile. Keppel and her husband continued to host impeccable parties and it was here that other exiled members of other royal families including Greece, Yugoslavia and Spain, as well as a young Winston Churchill himself. In the lead up to World War II, the Keppel family returned to England after decades away from their home country. Nothing was the same and their lives were completely changed forever. It was now 1940, on the cusp of technology of the 20th century and they were now old-fashioned ruins of bygone time. The monarchy had also changed beyond belief. King Edward VII's grandson, Edward VIII, was on the throne, but in 1936, he gave it all up and abdicated for his own royal mistress, Wallace Simpson. Eventually, the changed England became too much for Alice and George, and they went straight back to the ideals of their Italian villa in 1946. They had just spent six years in Britain and returned almost as soon as they could after the end of World War II. Her end was painful and in early 1947, Alice Keppel's life took a dark turn. She was now an old lady at 79 years old. She wasn't in the bloom of her youth and her health began to plummet. That September... The legendary mistress passed in her villa from cirrhosis of the liver. Against all odds, she remained married to her devoted husband of 56 years, George Keppel. They were still so in love with each other despite the arrangement earlier in their lives and George followed Alice only two months later, perhaps of a broken heart. They are now buried beside each other in Florence and Alice was infamous as a mistress to King Edward VII, but her legacy did not stop there. Her great-great-granddaughter is Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, who is the infamous mistress turned wife of Prince Charles. Charles, who is King Edward VII, great-great-great-grandson, and when Camilla first met Charles, legend has it that Camilla quipped, my great-great-grandmother was your great-great-grandfather's mistress, so how about it? 